But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hi everybody, welcome back to The Body Surf. This is James. I'm Jonathan. And we're at episode 97, which is dangerously close to 100. I thought for sure we were gone for at least three weeks. I was like, well, damn, like, we have to welcome ourselves back to The Body Surf. But it's only been 15 days, so I don't feel that bad. Fif exactly 15 days, exactly. really? Well, since the, last episode, since the last episode was released, and this one is being recorded. Okay. Yeah, so it, it wasn't that bad. I hope everyone has survived without us. Um, yeah, what have we been up to? I don't know, like back to business as usual. We went home to Rochester. You keep, you keep um, presuming people give a shit about what we've been up oh, to. Oh, that's true. I guess they're more interested in what tennis has been up to yeah. since then, right? Um, well, I think the big news is Laver Cup. Mm -hmm. Which... In the preamble, there was a lot of chatter about, is this going to work? Is this an exhibition? What exactly is Labor Cup and why should we care? So do you think they made a case that we should care? Yeah, it was a resounding success, I would say. So many people, especially on Twitter, were saying, well, I didn't give a damn about this tournament or event or exhibition beforehand, but thoroughly enjoyed it. It delivered a lot of moments. And to your point about people arguing about whether it was an exhibition. I feel like that was after the fact, and it was a very strange, ongoing dialogue slash argument that was extended mm. for some reason. Yeah. Like, on, on what level do we care about delineating whether it's a tournament or an exhibition or something else? Okay. Well, I think... So it clearly was... It's not a sanctioned tournament. There's no points involved. But it was definitely something different than your typical exhibition. It seemed like the players were really invested in the results. And they seemed to be, uh, like, trying quite a bit harder than you do at a, a normal exhibition. Like the Boodles or Kuyong or any of those that you get paid huge fees for. I think, well, they're paid huge fees for this as well. Oh, of course. But I think the point in people trying to make that distinction is folks who tend to fall on the exhibition side, I get the sense that a lot of them are trying to diminish or quell the fervor surrounding the mm. Liver Cup hype. And, and whereas other people who are drinking the Liver Cup Kool-Aid, they're like, well... What I witnessed was legit, and how dare you, kind of thing. You know, it's. Uh -huh. And then to my point, in wondering why people were having those discussions, it's like, didn't wasn't it enjoyable? Isn't that enough? Mm. I I don't understand. Yeah, I was, I was a labor cup uh, skeptic at first, a truther, if you will. I was not super excited about it. I was really cynical about the hype and the money and all the stuff that was going into it. But I have to say I enjoyed it. And to your point, I think that there are certain stakeholders in world tennis that want this to be thought of as a hit and giggle, as an exhibition. ITF is uh, number one there. Davis Cup is pissed off about it because they see the excitement and the international attention that this whatever, mm -hmm. this tournament got. And uh, they feel usurped. It's, ent it's an entirely different kettle of fish than Davis Cup. And the advantage that Labor Cup will always have over Davis Cup is that it's a one-off, one-weekend event once a year, say for Olympic years. Mm -hmm. Davis Cup goes on multiple weeks throughout multiple weekends throughout the year it's difficult to keep a track of what's going on who's still in it who's in world group who's in right. the playoff group and if you do get a hold of that in your head somehow it then changes by the end of the mm -hmm. year like 
Come July, I'm like, I, I don't know what's going on in Davis Cup or Fed Cup, even though I may have just watched the the ties maybe a, a month prior. Right. Like, there's nothing necessarily unique to Davis Cup that would have me just remembering it mm. like that. And the players have said repeatedly, the schedule needs to change if you want us to be more invested. We could do it every two years, for example. Or just change the format to make it more friendly, fan-friendly, but also more amenable to the players' schedules. Because, as we know, the tennis season is already too long, and Davis Cup Finals is after the final tournament of the year on the men's side. So I, I don't know if Labor Cup will have the ITF thinking long and hard about how to kind of revive Davis Cup. Because I do think it's a worthwhile event. I don't think that it should disappear, but it definitely needs to be amended for 2017. You have people... It's it's important to look at the Labor Cup and acknowledge the people who have vested interests in it. Right. Roger Federer has a huge <laughs> financial Again. and professional reputational stake in it, right? Yes. His management company is part of the group that's putting it on, along with Australia. Tennis Australia. And there's one other... Um, management partner mm. in that but when Roger's on Twitter giving you all these tweets you're like wow Roger's if you didn't know you'd be like Roger's really invested in this right uh, labor cup is so cool but Roger's out there promoting his event essentially it's a labor cup but it's his event oh yeah and, and so when he's saying oh these are some of my favorite moments and these are some of the not so best moments <laughs> and he's showing pictures of Rafa dragging up his shorts hilarious but it's also PR work that he's doing as oh, well. Oh, of course. And it does. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for this to be a legitimate tournament and have an active player as the owner, no. in my opinion. Which lends it to this sort of like Vegas entertainment aspect of Labor Cup. And they certainly delivered on that. Like, you, you can't beat Federer and Adal in doubles. We've never seen it before. We know that they have this friendship or this, this respect for each other, but you got to see this relationship on display in a way that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that little brainstorming session that was on film was clearly contrived. It was cheesy. But at the same time, even if it wasn't real, you did get to see... There were still truths, right. truths in it. And there was something that tennis fans rarely, if ever, get to see. This little planning session on who's going to take which side of the court... Yeah. And Nadal saying, "Oh, I don't care. I'll take whatever sign." <laughs> but to the back to the point about whether it's an exhibition or a tournament, it's that discussion is useful if we're talking about it in terms of the vested interests, mm -hmm. not in terms of well, are there any points? Which right. is one of the main deciding factors, right? Do the players get points from these events? That makes it legitimate. That makes it part of the the tour schedule. That makes it a tournament. I find it more interesting to find out, well, it's not a tournament because Federer is, it's, he's so heavily involved in it. Right. You know? Therefore, any, to me, any sort of scandal or question about whether the, the results were contrived is, is really a non-issue to me because this is clearly entertainment. I don't think they were because I don't think that Rafael Nadal is capable of throwing a match because he's so, so competitive, even at home. But um, it's not that important, to be honest. And also, if they started awarding points, they would actually have to honor the rankings in who was involved, right? Because really, they, they have the freedom to choose whoever they mm. want for these teams. They went all the way down to Denis Shapovalov on Team World, well, Francis Tiafo As a wild card pick. Which is not dissimilar to golf, okay? Yeah. Where the captains have two discretionary picks as wild cards. Oh, oh, oh! I see. But okay. to your point, if it's going to be a legitimate, legitimate event, then they're going to have to go through the rankings. And think about it: if if Murray, if Djokovic, if Vavrinka were all healthy and willing, what would have happened? <laughs> like this would have been well, even more of a laughing stock shit show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Team World wouldn't have gotten. A set. They would right? have had the benefit of a healthy team with maybe Del Potro and Nishikori, but like, who else is there? Yeah. Now, 
Do we want to talk about the aspect of gender in the whole thing? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have to take it? Yeah. Well, it's a men-only event. I, I know that uh, a few people who follow us were disappointed that uh, women were not included in some way. And I have to say, I was part of that group. It didn't... Why didn't you say something to me? What do you I mean? I never heard that. I'm not saying you, you know, didn't I, think I, it, I feel but like, like we have... I've kvetched about it a few times. I I was totally oh. caught off guard by that. It didn't prevent me from enjoying the actual event, but there was a definitely a feeling of it being a boys' club. What and, about it? Did you expect to have been done differently? Well, I mean, of course, I knew about this event for a long time from last year in the planning, and I knew that it was men only. Rod Laver was the centerpiece. It was Roger Federer's kind of brainchild, or at least his management company you know it's framed as roger federer's idea basically but uh you know here's the thing men's tennis will continue to not give a fuck about women's tennis that's just how it works these days i think what we both think one of the best uh aspects of tennis as a sport is that the men and women often play in the same place and they each sort of raise the entertainment value of the other the sport benefits from them both being there. So I think of what could be from either a joint tournament or a women's companion tournament. Someone on Twitter called it the Navratilova Cup. I thought, but, well, if I were to name it, I'd call it the King Cup. But that's... But... Billie Jean already is, has world team tennis. And she does. And she's not the greatest. I mean, you cannot, you certainly cannot call it the Margaret Smith Court Cup. Wait, so who should it be then? Are you saying it should be the Serena? No, 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 no. But we're talking about Rod Laver as a legend of the yeah, game. Yeah, but he's not the greatest. From both the pre and open era. Yeah, I mean, I would put Billie Jean right near up him, beside him. Okay. I mean, I don't think there's a huge discrepancy between the two to say it's the King Cup and the, the Labor Cup. This many years after the fact, whatever shortcomings Billie Jean has in trophies mm. is more than made up with by her contributions to tennis off the court. Okay. This is very hypothetical, obviously. Yes. Billie Jean does have a lot of stuff named after her okay. now, finally. Okay. And right, rightfully so. But, yeah, I was a little bummed that the women's game wasn't a part of this. I think a joint labor cup with women could be really exciting. We could have mixed doubles matches... I mean, it, you know, it might look a little bit like World Team Tennis, but with a different format. I don't need to be the one defending men. <laughs> but you're oh going dear, to? But it's the first time it's being held. Mm. Let's see what efforts are made going forward, either to, to tack something onto this or to have the woman have their separate event. I don't think it's necessarily... <clears throat> sexist for two separate events to happen. I mean, there's right. a template for mm -hmm. it. There's Ryder Cup in in a golf, and there's the women's equivalent. Okay. There's a Davis Cup, Fed Cup, you know, like these non-tour sanctioned events. They're, they're a different type of thing, mm. right? I can't speak to what Federer's... Uh, intentions were in putting this together, what something we'll talk about a little bit later on, what were the considerations maybe they did, and maybe it would have been a harder sell for TV, right. which is something you had and that's brought up in our agenda. something I always think about. Can a women's event like this attract the kind of money, the kind of sponsors and TV rights? And we know they have been dicked around with TV yeah. rights well, in the past. To be clear, if Nadal and Federer are that much into it, there'll be no issue selling the event if Rafa and Federer are carrying the event regardless. Right, right. But... When women's tennis has, has to go it alone, or, you know, in TV contracts, sponsorships, they're at a, a huge disadvantage, mm. of course. So blaming the women's tennis leadership is not always a good idea because you don't know what exactly is going on behind closed doors. Let's also be clear about this. Without Federer and Nadal, this event is absolute shit. Well... It's a People are, total are not non going to watch, watch Jack Sock versus... Uh, no, like who, who cares Sorry. about this event if we didn't get to see more than what we expected with what Fidel gave us yeah. this past weekend? 
Like the the ATP, the Labor Cup, everything having to do with men's tennis has ridden the coattails of these two men for the past 15 years. And then we've had Marian Djokovic as well, mm. in their own right, support them. But to be clear, these are the two who have carried tennis in general for the last 15 years. Well, and also the ATP has put all of their eggs in the fed Fedal basket, uh-huh. you know. Which is to say, the reckoning is coming. There will be a time, oh, of course. just like there was in that vacuum period before Federer ascended to the heavens on his golden throne, that men's tennis is going to be going through it. Mm-hmm. And the scary thing is, is that women's tennis may go through it at the same time. Unless, you know, a, a people like dominant champions who are outside of the, the tennis fandoms because it brings eyes to the sport, like what Serena did in the early 2000s. But, or I we mean... Could, it could just be an entirely unique period where we have multiple, multiple slam winners. You could for, yeah. potentially yep. see Ostapenko having four at one point alongside Muguruza with five with a Sloan could be a multiple winner yeah we could have five or six players with multiple slams and just not dominating yeah like, we just don't know what tennis will look like so what about the actual labor cup play like it was something that stuck out for but are me. we done with this oh. like men only problem well i think so i just i would be remiss if we didn't mention it yeah but again, like it didn't take away from me actually enjoying sitting down and watching the tennis. Do you think anything about that skepticism and outrage is manufactured? Um, I well, it depends who it comes from, obviously. From you? Oh, from me? Or no, no, or no. people who? Um, maybe this is my own disappointment in myself that I didn't mm. even think about it <laughs> when this. I'm like, what? Like yeah. it's a, it's a men's exhibition event. Right, right. Like, in the style of Davis Cup, Ryder Cup, I, get, I just didn't quite get it. I'm not going to... I'm just not going to be super mad about it, but I do think that anytime you can bring the men's and women's game together is an opportunity. We also That's have it. to remember that men's tennis, as you've said before, and the powers that be involved in administering and running men's tennis... They don't give a fuck about women's tennis. No. Like, the default is to treat women's tennis as Cinderella's deformed sister trapped <laughs> in the closet. Well, I think you're getting your fairy tales really mixed up there. Which is the one that was left behind? Cinderella has a slipper, right? Yeah. She had to scrub the floors. Yeah. So, like, even worse than Cinderella. <laughs> the deformed sister trapped wow. in the closet. She does not have a deformed sister, though. We don't know. Maybe she was trapped in the okay. closet. The point is, that's how poorly women's tennis is is treated. <laughs> Cue five more reviews from Australia. Oh, my God. <laughs> Australia, you're dealing with your own shit right now, so just get your house in order. Okay, why don't we talk about the actual tennis that went on? I was... Probably the first thing I wrote, this is so sad. Poor Tomas Berdish lost every match that he played in <laughs> in front of his home crowd as you pointed out well maybe he shouldn't have played so badly why are you feeling sorry for him i know i mean you go from being feeling riled up that the women weren't including in labor cup to like spilling tears for Tomas burdick <laughs> who has shown himself to be woefully underperforming to his talent his entire career and yeah. then does this at labor yeah. cup like i i just don't have any sympathy for him mm. in the situation I, of all the things to care about in tennis this year this is <laughs> not one of them I mean Rafa tried his best to beat Kyrgios and Sok single handed but he could not do it I mean Berdic is just not a doubles player he is terrible he was so bad at the net it was not even funny then he lost to Kyrgios in singles which fine no big deal, but he did lead a set, and he was really playing against a supposedly injured or hobbled Kyrgios. And then they put him on doubles again with Chilich. Who made this roster, really? Meanwhile, Dominic Team only plays once. Right. He's on the sidelines, eating food, <laughs> looking miserable. 
Um, and he won his only match, a great one against Isner. And the same thing with TFO and Shapovalov, only played once that first day. I'm like, why were these players even invited? I realize your stars are there, but like, a Dominic team is a top 10 player. This is how these events work. If I get yeah. back to Ryder Cup, yeah. the captain picks who to pick, who to play. It's not uncommon for somebody to sit out a lot. Right. And Nadal was wiped on the third day and lost to uh, to Isner to make it close, right? To, to allow Federer to be the clincher. And that's why some people were saying, oh, this is all this is all fake or whatever. And again, like, who really cares? This is not an ATP tournament. It's not a Grand Slam. Isn't that unbelievable that Nadal could lose to Isner no. on an indoor surface? <laughs> not at all. Not to me. McEnroe <laughs> says, let's finish this son of a bitch off. Referring mm-hmm. to Rafael Nadal. Yeah. And Nadal was asked about... Of course, somebody brought it up in press and said, hey, this is what he said about you. And he was just like, whatever. Of course he should be asked about it. Okay. I mean... The thing is, when you put John McEnroe at the head of a team, you have to expect, expect like, low-class gutter behavior from him. And then his aura is just obviously going to go down to the team, right? And also, when you have three Trump voters on a team, like, I don't give a fuck what they do. Like, I don't care about them from the jump. This is where the event veered into more of an exhibition, when you have McEnroe doing that kind of stuff, which uh, you can say absolutely make the argument that it's disrespectful to Rafa, but within another context of trying to relate, who was, who was it that Rafa was playing at the time? Um, I don't even remember. I think it was Jack Sock. Yeah, it was Jack Sock. You have McEnroe coaching Jack Sock, coaching, coaching Kyrgios, Kokonakis, all these young guys, and... Within that context of McEnroe and the boys will be boys, which we absolutely rail against. <laughs> but, mm. you know, the whole la da flippant, kind of McEnroe-esque 80s vibe. <laughs> that's not a tournament. It's It can play to the audience as like a positive thing mm. and not necessarily disrespectful. So I think this was one of the, the areas where the lines were blurred a little bit. That made it confusing to the viewers right. as to what exactly the tournament or exhibition was. And then Team World was on the sidelines all the time doing these ridiculous routines, doing push-ups, little dances, it, it, like over-the-top shit. Which I'm sure played well for TV and, and for uh, you know little videos and gifs to play on Twitter or whatever. But Team Europe was obviously like just glancing over and shaking their heads. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it made for, again, a, different, a, a, a totally different contrast of styles. Of course. And the choice of Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe as team captains encapsulates that, Did that contrast. Did Borg show any emotion the entire weekend? <laughs> I love Bjorn Borg. I mean, I, I tweeted something about why I love Serena and why I love Bjorn Borg and they're totally opposite reasons and it just kind of captures how irrational fandom is but I you just like I just totally respect Bjorn's coolness utter calm because it's so different from me like I can't imagine how anyone could be like that are you (laughs) you trying to give a hint as to you being a tyrant no (laughs) No, I even I even said like I I love Serena so much in part because I relate to her uh rage. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So you're But at the same time I right love now. Borg so much because of what you because he is what I'm not. That's know? what I'm saying. Yeah. You finally but people finally people will understand what I've had to I'm deal not with. Hide, I'm not hiding for the last that. 10 years. I'm an open book here. Okay. <laughs> How can one even root for a team helmed by John and Patrick McEnroe. <laughs> That's just asking way too much. I don't know. I'm sure a lot of Americans can. It it was just, aside from the, the whole Trump thing, which I can't get over, it's just not a super inspiring or exciting team. Nick Kyrgios was really the only one on Team World that got a rise out of the crowd when they were introduced. 
And I have to say that Jack Sock was probably the MVP of Team World. He I mean, he was incredible in their doubles matches. Yeah, but Nick Nick was the MVP. Nick had to stare down Federer in mm. that final match and played right I mean, to the end. came very, very close to winning. Had a match point and lost in, uh, what, like 10-8 or something in the, the match tiebreak. Okay. He was the only one to get a point on day one. He was the one that really kept them in it for mm-hmm. most of the events. I mean, Nick was really the only exciting, was like the spark of Team World. And not to say that Dennis and Francis won't be someday, but like they're not there yet. And they weren't really used that much. Not just spark, pedigree. Mm. Like You could mm. tell that he had the pedigree to play with these top guys on the European team, whereas the rest yeah. of the, the world guys just didn't. Sad to say. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Well, Isner did like, beat it all. Yeah, whatever. Like, I don't know her. <laughs> yes. She's too tall for me to even see her. Do it at a major, honey. If you look on the Wikipedia page for Labor Cup, it will say, will describe the event and then it will close by saying, this is not an official event. No points are awarded as of 2017. So I would not <laughs> be surprised if this is not something that they want to have become official in the calendar and part of the ATP setup mm. to be giving people points. And I don't know how long Federer has to keep playing for that to happen. Right. <laughs> because the moment he stops playing is the moment, like... Yeah. I mean, if he's not there, you better have Rafa, Andy, and Novak. Mm-hmm. All three. And which is why this was a success, because of Federer and Rafa. Mm-hmm. The two of them playing doubles, the two of them having those amazing points Federer calling for a lob on Rafa be like nope and almost <laughs> whack his head oh Federer God. has to duck out of the way mm. but then immediately get back to position where he should be for Federer whiffing a ball at net yes. you know all these imperfections that complemented the perfection of the two of them playing together mm-hmm. It actually made it feel real because you got a sense that these two are two of the greatest ever, possibly the two greatest ever, but they're not going to be a world-beating doubles team without practicing, right? You you got a sense that, wow, there is real strategy and, and experience that plays into playing doubles that they don't have together. So there were times when Sock and Query would just go down the middle And both of them would miss it because they didn't know who was supposed to go for it. But it was still important for them to win. Yeah, oh, yeah. Not just in the doubles match, but to win singles matches. And for the European team to have that moment of Federer uh, clinching it in the end. Yeah. And for that reason, and for the wild success it had on social media with the sharing of GIFs, take note, ATP. I don't think there were any cease and desist letters sent Mm. by Labor Cup people Uh saying that all those gifs of Roger and Rafa should be taken down. Right. Because that is the best promotion you can have for an event. Exactly. It is so It was never more apparent than this past weekend. And And so Federer Nadal made this event. And it was a success. And I enjoyed it. And I make no apologies for being a Fedal fanboy this weekend <laughs> because they they are a huge part of tennis and they gave us something special. Mm-hmm. Okay. Elsewhere in tennis, we're in the Asian swing. A lot of tournaments are going on. It is so hard to keep up. But one of the big results this past week was Wozniacki wins Tokyo Got to her seventh final of the year and finally won one. I mean, she's had an incredible year. It's easy to say, oh, she's been losing all these finals. Let's talk about her performance in semifinals this year. Like, unbeatable. She beat Muguruza 6-2, 6-love. This is a very capable number one player in the world who's had an incredible summer. Bageled Muguruza. Like, how does that even happen? With that, I mean... Caroline's backhand is just world class, and it's probably the best it's ever been. She finishes off Muguruza with that six-love bagel in the semifinal, and then starts 
her final against Pavlyuchenkova with another bagel. <laughs> so back-to-back bagels and wins the title, repeats, defends in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. And elsewhere in Tokyo, so I believe Wozniacki beat Osaka last year in the final, right? That was a big breakthrough for Naomi Osaka. Mm-hmm. Kerber has showed some signs of life in Tokyo. I believe and, you meant to say has shown. Oh my god, did I say has showed? Yeah. Oh, that's so stupid. That is very bad English I'm so major. sorry. Um, Kerber beat Osaka, who vanquished her at the US Open in the first round, and who was the defending finalist in Tokyo. And she also beat Kazakina and Pliskova. And she was, uh, I mean, she was getting stomped by Pavlyuchenkova in the semifinals, but made it a match. Like, really did. So, I don't know. I I have to hope that this is a sign of good things to come. That maybe the the pressure of defending majors and a ranking has lifted and she can play her game again. This kind of, like, e- aggressive defense. I remember uh, checking my my app for that score because I was, I was curious to see if Kerber could make it to the final if this was going to be that big comeback moment for her now that she didn't have number one, she didn't have a, a Grand Slam to defend. And I remember looking at it and seeing 6-love-5-2, six love, six six love five two, and I was like, oh my god, that's just terrible. Mm. Like, this is such a disappointment, such a letdown. And then, from what I gather, Pavlichenkova started spraying balls a little bit too overly aggressive, and Kerber found her way back into that match. Took it mm-hmm. to a tie break in the second set, then eventually lost, I think, 4-6 in the third. But, you know, again, an encouraging result. She then goes to Wuhan and loses in the first round to but, Caroline Garcia. But basically everybody did. Yeah, uh, but it's still to Caroline Garcia, who is mm-hmm. playing very well. Yeah, and she's now in the quarters. Uh-huh. She's beating everybody she should beat and pushing everybody who does beat her to the limit. Mm-hmm. And I really do feel, like I did at the start of the season, <laughs> that she is close to having a big breakthrough. She's got the talent. Yeah. To your point, though, we are seeing, again, just how difficult it is for players to be successful in back-to-back weeks. It's very difficult to go deep in one event and then come turn around a couple days later do your press for the new event, get acc- get acclimatized to the new surface. Even though it's the same surface, mm-hmm. different speeds, yep. different bounces, different temperature, could different crowds. Different balls. You could have been playing in front of 500 people in Tokyo, and then there's only two people in Wuhan. So there's a lot to adjust to. Is uh, was that was that shade? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there there we have it with 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 Kerber. You can't necessarily look at a player going deep one week and losing the next week and saying, oh, they're a flop. I think it's unrealistic, legitimately, to expect players to go deep in back-to-back events. Mm. And when they do, kudos to them. Yeah, I mean, I can barely work a five-day week. It's, like, too much. I'm like, when is the next holiday? And then you're you're talking about traveling in between tournaments as well. It's it's just crazy. Mm. The tennis schedule is just crazy. What else happened? So another one, Ostapenko won Seoul. She beat Haddad Maya in the final. And she's had, uh, you know, she's had ups and downs since her French Open final. She made the quarterfinals of Wimbledon, but she's had some kind of flop results as well. So I think it's good to see her on the board again. She played a smaller event. It was smart. Mm -hmm. She was a top seed. Yep. And again, like she's beating the people she should be beating. Right? Like, that's a way to gain confidence. She did have some injuries in the hardcourt summer. Yeah. Demir Jumor, who will definitely be added to my thirst list next time yes. we do it. I've been... Well, what I, What an oversight. I knew. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't. I'm, I've been knowing for a while. You, you been knew? Yeah. <laughs> he won St. Petersburg, and he beat uh, the sewer in the final. Mm-mm. Well, I mean, he does go by Fonia, which means sewer. Oh. Yeah. Educate us children. What? <laughs> he that's why he calls himself Fonia, because he thinks it's funny. Oh. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. And that. I mean, it could not be more fitting, obviously. Demir is the first Bosnian champion of any ATP title. Mm-hmm. So good. Don't on you him. mean to say from Yugoslavia? Yep. 
Oh, wait, where? Who said that? I don't remember. Listeners, this happened somewhere in the tennis world where somebody referred to somebody as from Yugoslavia. But it doesn't exist anymore. No, I think it was on a TV show we were watching. Really? Maybe. I don't know. Oh. In Mets, with a draw full of French guys, qualifier Peter, Peter Goyovich, I'm not sure if that's correct. He's from Germany. He got to the final and beat Benoit Paire to win his first title. Both, I mean, it was a very... And we finally discovered what Benoit Paire's beard is for. It's to catch all those buckets of tears oh that he's God. crying. That is so rude. That's really mean. Because it was actually a very affecting trophy presentation. No, I agree. Uh, I, yeah. But I have to make fun of that hideous beard. Oh, yeah. It is such an obnoxious monstrosity, an offense to humankind. Well, the tide has really turned this week because people spotted some gray in it. And they mm. finally were turned off by it, which I also find very rude. Either like the beard or don't. The gray doesn't have anything to do with it. Because some of us with dark hair, like myself, the gray shows, okay? You could have like it two gray hairs, but they show. every ounce of restraint <laughs> not to put you on blast right now. No. Can I? No. Please? But that trophy presentation was very affecting. If you can find the... I think I retweeted it. Peter Goyevich was really emotional. Benoit was crying. It's just, it's cool when people care. When he was, you know, it's it's heartening to see someone really affected by losing that title. And I, I like when men cry, so that's always a plus. Exactly. Wuhan is the big women's event going on. It's, uh, you know, really like the big Asian WTA event before Singapore. It's a premier event. And man... I mean, what you can expect from this stage in the season, a ton of the top seeds are out. Kvitova lost to Pung. Kanta was out to Ash Barty. So we're having a Barty party. She also beat Radwanska today. Mm -hmm. So Barty is in the, the quarterfinals. Halep went out in the first round to Kazakina. Wozniacki lost as well to Sakari. Mm -hmm. Sloan flew all the way to China, left her hot boyfriend, and lost to Wang in the first round. Madison also lost in the first round to Lepchenko. But Madison had a, a recurrence or maybe just a flare-up or just was maybe bothered by it more than usual. It didn't seem like it was a, a new thing, but she had wrist issues oh, in that match. Oh, God, no. Not like... It didn't seem... Her dis description of it was like, yeah, it's something I've been dealing with. Not that it's a new injury, but just residual getting back to where she needs to be, maybe. I don't know, okay. but she was still bothered by it in that match. All right. Aside from, I don't want to harp on, on the losses here. The players who are doing really well, hello again, Ashley Barty, Caroline Garcia, Alizé Cornet, Maria Sakari have all had great results at this tournament. And it's a there's a lot of points on the line at this tournament. This has been the story of the WTA season. Mm. When one person who you expect to not do well, when one person who you expect to do well doesn't, somebody else puts their hand yeah. up and then has their own story that they're telling you about. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's not that people are limping to victory. No. Somebody else, like you said, steps forward. And is like, we have yeah. Barty and we have Garcia, who are both threatening to have a big breakout moment. And that's been bubbling under for a little while. Uh, Sakari has been playing well. Lepchenko has been having a few results here and there. And uh, Pong is resurgent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Muguruza is still around. And Plichu is still around. So, cool. I'm, I'm with it. We have some big news on the race to Singapore front. Would you like to tell them? Well, it went from just... Muguruza having qualified to everybody and their grandmother qualifying <laughs> with span, within the span of a couple of days. So as of now, Muguruza, Halep, Pliskova, Svitolina, Venus, and Wozniacki all have qualified for Singapore, which is a good lineup. Mm -hmm. 
And to be honest, they'll likely be joined by Kanta and Ostapenko. Right. There's, a, there's a big gap. There's a huge gap. And Kuznetsova, who is one of the candidates, she's still struggling with her, I believe, wrist as well. She was unable to hit two-handed backhands in Wuhan. Mm. She was hitting slice backhands and then even went with a one-handed passing shot winner at one point, losing, <laughs> I think, 6-3, 6-3. And it was described by somebody on Twitter that it was kind of a miracle that it was even that close. Mm. And one has to think that maybe the only reason why she was playing was because she was trying to get to Singapore again like she did last year. All of this is to say, I think the top eight is pretty much locked up. Yeah. Mladenovic is nine. and She's lost seven matches in a row. I think now it's eight even. And all straight sets, I think. It's, It's pretty atrocious. Is... Quite the slide. I mean... Do you remember when we said that whole talk shit get hit mm. thing back in the early season when she <laughs> talked all that shit and she backed it up? Yeah. In beating Maria, in having all these great results to start the year. And now it's... I mean, she's not out here talking about it anymore. Right, right. But it's... It's just unfortunate. Well, after she beat Garbinier at the French Open, those two have had totally opposite trajectories. So Mladenovic will be number one in Zhuhai if the, if the rankings stay how they are. Uh, but, I mean, there's really no chance that she's going to jump into Singapore. Unless something miraculous happens. Mm-hmm. But the big news, I mean, it's not a huge surprise, but Venus Williams has qualified for the WTA Finals for the first time since 2009. Mm-hmm. Eight years since she last did it. She mm. came close last year. She did. And uh, didn't quite get there. She made, she played in Zhuhai in 2015, I believe. She won Zhuhai in 2014, or I don't remember. It was. I think it was the first year, it was a year in she won Mm -hmm. it, which would have been 2015, I think. And if you recall, Venus won that event in 2015 to get back into the top 10 for the first time. Mm -hmm. So this has been two years in the coming, in the making. For Venus to get to this spot and it being indoors, this could be a good scenario for Venus. It could be. She's been getting up for the big tournaments lately. Mm -hmm. I think it will be important, not that she is concerned with these things, but with so so many Grand Slam points to defend next year, this might be a nice opportunity to vulture some points. Mm. Because we'll only see her in Beijing, I believe, before, uh, before Singapore. Yeah, so coming up, Beijing is the next big tournament. It's a joint tournament. There's an ATP 500 there, and the women are going to be there. It's one of those, the few flip flip side events, right? Where the women are the higher tiered event. That is correct. It's a big women's tournament. The winner is going to get 1,000 points. After that, we have Shanghai, which is a men's Masters 1,000 event. Paris Indoors is later. Basel... Dave's Cup, all that stuff. But the women's tour ends before the men's tour. Yeah. And basically, Singapore is really three weeks away. It's that close? It's October 22nd, I believe it starts. Oh. So yeah, we're we're almost there. There's just a few weeks of tournaments left. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of relieved that there's not this big race to Singapore push. I, I kind of like that the the top eight is pretty much set in stone at this point. And on the men's side, everybody's injured and not playing, so who cares? <laughs> right. And the thing is, with all these tournaments, Beijing, Shanghai, Annie Murray has basically won all of them last year, so those points are going to drop off yeah, rapidly. We, we talked about this. Yeah. He's going to be... So many of the top men are going to be outside the top 10 come Australia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a bit of an update on James Blake's case. If you've been following this, we've talked about it a few times Over the past, well, it's been going on for two years now. James Blake, who was tackled and humiliated and treated really poorly by the NYPD uh, on a case of supposedly mistaken identity, has decided not to sue, but was able to establish this civilian uh, kind of review board to provide a voice for New York City citizens to complain to 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 file formal complaints and have a process to go through in cases of police mistreatment or brutality 
And at the time we praised him for kind of taking a route that was so much bigger than himself rather than suing the the city of New York and trying to get money, basically. He was actually creating like a structural change in the city and the way that it deals with police brutality complaints. Now, he is done playing because he's gone on Twitter, on his social media, and said, listen, Bill de Blasio, this officer needs to be fired. I don't like how this disciplinary hearing is going. You have, Bill de Blasio has said the results of the hearing will not be made public. And so this is where James and probably a lot of other people are like, well, that's clear what the result is going to be. This guy's not going to get fired. It's going to be a slap in the wrist. And they're trying to just sweep it under the rug. That's clearly what's going on here. And the thing is, the New York City, the NYPD police union is powerful. And police unions are often extremely regressive and reactionary organizations. I don't think that's a secret. And I think there's a lot of pressure on de Blasio to just move past this. But James is out here saying, listen, I chose not to sue. You need to fire this guy. He had five disciplinary complaints in seven months, all against black men. He doesn't deserve to work for the NYPD anymore. Get him off the street. He's not fucking around anymore. He's asking people to share on Twitter, to reach out to the mayor of New York. This officer needs to be fired. So that's what I'm doing. I'm I'm part of the call. I, I'm really heartened to see James Blake take such a strong stance on this. Because people were surprised. Why is he testifying? I thought this was all done with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't want to get money, but he wants to get Officer Frascator out of the NYPD. Which, really, if you did your job that poorly, would you still have a job? No. It's just... And in such a high-profile manner, too, it's crazy. Police unions will protect literally anything. I guess that's what you pay dues for. Shall we finish up with things we like and dislike? Sure. Um, I actually have more things I like this time, which is unusual. You have, I see one here. Do you have more that you're not telling me about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't write it down. How many do you have? Two. I have one I like. Do you have any you dislike? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, of course. Okay. Well, let's let's settle in for this segment. Yeah. My thing I like is... So Slate has a podcast, a new podcast called Hit Parade, I think it's called. And it's basically like a look at popular music through the Billboard charts. And one of their first episodes was about the relationship between Elton John and George Michael. But it, all, it took you through kind of their their careers respectively and how when elton john was well he basically outed himself as bisexual in the late 70s he had been enjoying one of the most successful periods in pop music history in the u.s and basically fell off the face of the earth like nobody wanted to play him anymore and his popularity suffered immensely and so it traces George Michael's rise and Elton John sort of creating this relationship with George Michael based on admiration, but also like, hey, maybe I can, you know, kind of get back into the public's good graces alongside George Michael. It's fascinating. So I, Don't let the sun go down on me mm-hmm. was the manifestation of that. Yeah. Right? So while George Michael was having a huge run of success in the 80s, that duet got Elton John his first number one in many years. So, so, so check that out. Hit Parade. What else um, do you like? Of course, the new season of Transparent. Mm. I We watched it in two days, mm-hmm. barely two days. It was framed by the soundtrack of Jesus Christ Superstar, which is so exciting for me. You have no idea. I absolutely love that as a theme throughout the season. Um, the whole family goes to Israel, and they do handle kind of the the dispute the troubles if you will in uh the israel the israeli palestinian friction in they handle it in a a, a friction they handle it in a more responsible and nuanced way than i expected i shouldn't be surprised because it is a smart and sensitive show 
But um, I thought it was it was pretty skillful how they addressed it without really falling on one side, I felt. And you may get a different read if you watch the show yourself. But I just absolutely adore the show and how confident and sensitive and grown up it is about read, following this family. I read reviews ahead of time that essentially were lamenting the fact that the season wasn't as good as previous seasons. When in fact it was one of my favorite seasons. I thought mm. it was strong from top to bottom. I didn't really take to what's what's the character I really dislike again? I can never remember her name. Oh Allie. Allie yes. Uh, this whole Ali's come to moment of being shown the way, not coming to, but being shown the way mm -hmm. of the Palestinian plight. Okay, girl. Like, all this is coming down to in the end, and I had a much more cynical view of it than mm -hmm. you did. Like, here she is using people again. That's, that's all I can right, see from but... her. But in the net result of that is that they are showing us the minutia, the day-to-day life of what it's like in Palestine to mm. an extent to a small extent which I mean when do you see this aside from something like Homeland mm -hmm. or a show about terrorism you get an actual real picture of yeah. normal life and so they did use her narcissism as a vehicle so I shouldn't let my dislike of her as a character <laughs> cloud what they were able to do as a, as a show so good for yeah. that but Josh Alley we always say that the characters, the children in particular, are just some of the most horrible people on Earth. In, in like, fake Earth. <laughs> uh, but they did a lot of good stuff for the eldest daughter this season. I oh, thought. Sarah? Yes, yeah, Sarah. I mean, Sarah is also, I can like, never remember. Worst. She is the worst. She's the too. worst, but I actually enjoyed her this season. Yeah. Remember last season, somebody told her that she was full of darkness mm -hmm. at one of the events at the synagogue? And you... <laughs> It's true. But I think with Ali, the show is not naive too hard to how narcissistic she is. And like you said, they use it. Mm -hmm. Like they want us to see it because we're we're sort of laughing at her. But we're also, I found myself empathizing with her so much more than I ever had because I thought she was sort of the conscience of the season. It's a slippery slope, man. Yeah. To be talking about the conscience of the season when all that narcissism and privilege is wrapped up so neatly into one bundle right you right. know like maybe you're giving too much credit to all right to one person and if you can be giving her credit why not give josh the credit you have nothing good to say oh, about because i don't I just, but what's the material ugh. difference between the two let's be real yeah fine i just don't don't like him the mvp as always is miss judith light mm -hmm. she just keeps getting better and better you know why because they have invested so much more in her character. She's not comic relief anymore. She's fully formed. She's, I mean, it's just an absolutely brilliant performance. Yet another example of what talented actresses can do, even when they're older. Which they always were able to, but mm -hmm. we're just now getting to see it on a more regular basis. So hopefully... You know, the Golden Girls didn't happen for nothing. <laughs> that 30 years on, we're now being able to see the fruits of that. And yes. people being reminded. Keep writing these parts, please. So those are my two things I like. Uh, what do you like? I have one thing here I didn't really have much time to prepare. But the mm -hmm. one good thing I like is The Good Place. Which you told me I didn't quite remember that our friend Albert uh, recommended it to us a while back. Many, many times. And yeah. a long time ago at this point. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this might be... Y'all might know Dalbert, actually. Dalbert was a featured artist in episode four... Not episode four, issue four of Racket Magazine. Yeah. He was... He was the one who did those illustrations of tennis is within the mind. And so you had yeah. a... Like, a mind within a mind within a mind and then people playing tennis inside of it. Uh... Yes, yep. we, we got so him. He's, uh... We got him the hookup. It was <laughs> deserved. You can see that his uh, his work is seriously good. He's, he's really talented. So talented. If you ever need to hire an illustrator, you know, let us know. <laughs> yeah, we can we can continue to put bread on Dalbert's table. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can put it on ours too if you want. <laughs> uh, 
So the good place. The good place. I I needed a show to watch when you're with your nine to five, tired, boring ass self, gone to bed early at eleven o'clock. Mm-hmm. Like, and I have to fill. When most people go to bed on weeknights. Whatever. You just seem like you forget, like you've been going to bed at between two and three for the last eight years. Well, I don't have the option anymore. Okay, but you know, <laughs> no, I'm just meant left here to my own devices for four hours. I have to find time, find stuff to do. You could always just go to bed. No, that's not an option. Mm, okay. At eleven o'clock, if I don't have to get up to go to work, who does that? <laughs> that's insane behavior. And so I, I gave the good place a shot. I do this thing where. If it's in a genre I like, and if there's a nice correlation between Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb, mm-hmm. where they're both over 8 out of 10, mm-hmm. or 80%, then okay, that's the starting point. And then you read the reviews, and it's like, okay, let me give this a go. And I thoroughly enjoyed season one. I'm all caught up. You still have a couple episodes to get caught up, because season two has started already. Mm. But you have discovered the twist. Yes. And, and I had been reading about this twist is uh, pretty foundational to the series, but also really clever and well done. So I really, I could not guess what it was. And obviously, we're not going to spoil it here. And we, I mean, I can't speak for you, but I had read about the show before for months. And I'd been hearing about this twist even before I decided to watch the show. And so I'd, I needed to speed through to get to it because I was already hooked on the show and I wanted to know. And I was a little bit disappointed. Wow. Not in the twist itself, but how the twist has been handled thus far. That's all I'm going to say. All right. All right. Things we dislike. Again, TV. I, uh, we're back in September, mid-September, end of September, where all these fall TV shows are starting back. We watched This Is Us last night. Well, I did, and then you watched it today. Mm. I did not enjoy it. It made me realize how much I think the show is overrated. That if we didn't have the black side of the family tied up into that story, we'd be left with a lot of mediocrity. No, it would not be watchable it without w- Randall and Beth yeah. and his family. And previously, the grandfather. William, yeah. Yes. I struggle with names. On these I, I, just can't, I couldn't remember his name. I can't But Ron Cephas Jones is mm. the actor who is incredible. But without that side of the family, it's actually an unwatchable show. (laughs) It becomes so trite, so tedious. Uh, Justin, is that the brother's name? Uh, I think so. Justin and then the sister, what's her name? Mary, Miranda, what's her name? Mary. What's her name? (laughs) Kate. Kate, yeah. Justin and Kate. No, I think that's like his real name. I don't think that's his name. Anyway, the blonde, the the Manny. Yes, the Manny, and then Kate, and then Toby. That trifecta... Toby Toby is the worst. That trifecta mm-hmm. is just too much. <laughs> I mean, it's unreal. And I don't know. I, I, not only do we have Mandy Moore once, we have Mandy Moore twice. Mm-mm. Double the serving of mediocrity. Mm-mm. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean... Candy enjoyed it as a prepubescent, Who? you know? Her song. Oh, oh, yeah, Her song yeah, Candy yeah, yeah. with the rollerblades and the big ball like thing. Candy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who misses Candy? It didn't make sense, but... I, I still enjoyed it in that time. Mm-hmm. And now, I just... How did we get to a place where Mandy Moore is helming... And, and getting nominated for, like, Golden Globes and shit. Well, if she's getting nominated, she has to, if Kate's getting nominated. Well, I... I don't think either of them should really be there. But but if Kate's there, then that's true. Mandy should be taking yeah. home all the awards. Mm-mm. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'll probably still hate watch it for a while. But no, but we got a, a scene with Beth and William again, which yes. is such a treat. Yes. It's like practically worth the price of admission, mm-hmm. which is free. But it was, yeah. People were saying, oh my God, the ending of this Premiere episode had me crying. It was so great. I looked at him like, bitch, please, what? Oh, I mean, it was it was hard like, to watch can... the kids like that. No, I did not give one mm. goddamn fuck wow. about that. Because wow. you know what? The main problem with the show too far, this well, far as is, well, uh... they've been dragging out this death mm. in ways that's just really unseemly. Like, the dude died. They're also making him out to seem 
to the viewers and by Mandy Moore that he was the greatest man ever. When we know no man is great. Every man <laughs> has some fucking skeleton in his closet <laughs> where he's done something real heinous. Right? I, I don't know if all that is true. Anyway, no, the, the point thing is, is I'm not about to buy this story that Milo Ventimiglia or whatever, Jack, that he's this outrageously good father. I mean, and he man. is a piece of ass. If you want to say that, say that. <laughs> that, is, that part is true. But the, there's that. And then there, it just seems like this manipulation of emotion. It's where this show just falls totally short of parenthood, which is what it was compared to when it was first coming yeah, on. that's the thing. Parenthood was organic feels every week, mm-hmm. and this feels manipulated in the gimmicky. same way that Scandal has struggled for years, finally found its footing a little bit again last season with the whole gimmicky stuff. Like you don't have to try so hard and telegraph all the emotions. Mm. That's not what makes a great show. And so when you don't have... Randall and Beth and William. That's it for me. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I was I just had a real rough forty minutes last night trying to get through this shit. Oh my god. And but Randall and Beth's daughters. Who Randall Who Randall referred to as Amorosa and Stacy Dash. Oh my god. <laughs> because they made a regressive comment about yes. gender. Yes. <laughs> How many people did not get that joke? Right. You know? Oh, the thing that I dislike this week and every week is bicycles on the sidewalk. I don't know how the, how traffic works in the city that you all are from, but in Toronto, bikes go on the street because you know what goes on the sidewalk? People who are walking. People who are trying to fucking walk without getting run over. So I, you know... How many, is, how many cyclists have no, you kicked off the road? No, that's Or call him to fall, the cause to is, fall into the middle of the road? <laughs> the thing is, as I've gotten older, I've realized, you know, you don't always know who you're dealing with. So you need to approach with caution. You mean that so, lesson I tried to teach you 10 years ago? So, right. But okay. you need to come to it yourself, you know. Mm. So I have told numerous people, please get off the sidewalk. You sure it wasn't, please get the fuck out of my way? That's what I would like to say. Mm. But... You, you, again, you don't know. Some people could come up and kill you or something. So I said, please get off the goddamn side. You've been known to walk through these streets banging on cars. I don't do that anymore. But I will say, as a pedestrian in this city, in any city, you need to be ready to go at any moment. You need to be ready to fight because cars will kill you. I mean, you're just a little old person and this car can do anything. So when people... When cars try to cross into my lane when I have a walk sign, yes, I have banged on hoods of cars. And I continue to do so. Mm. They need to know. They need to be scared of you. So that's why I'm ready to go at a moment's notice as a pedestrian. And as I remind you, as my friend once told me many years ago, many years before she became a doctor, mm. that I that she challenges you to point to an instance where you've seen a car hooked up to a drip in a <laughs> hospital room. That is have such you, a mom thing to say. Have you ever seen that before? <laughs> like you can, you can have all the best inten- intentions, the all the right of ways, all the nobleness. Mm-hmm. But that don't help you ass when you're run over. No, I would say I do something. It's like defensive walking. Mm. You know, I try to be proactive when I can, like get a tell a cyclist to get off the goddamn sidewalk Mm. that protects me and other pedestrians so that's what i don't like i'm gonna be out here writing tickets (laughs) lord on that note i don't know when the next episode will be tennis has been pretty quiet lately maybe it'll be another two weeks maybe we'll come with you come at you with something fun we'll get a little bit creative because we do need three more episodes to get to episode 100 before the end of the season that was our goal stated privately no publicly Mm. So there is, you're guaranteed at least three more episodes before the end of the season, which is absolutely doable. Oh, yeah. Because we, we're going to do at least 100 mm-hmm. for this year. Yeah. And I think it'll be easy to go over. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at Tennis underscore John. I'm James. I'm at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. The podcast is also on Twitter at The Body Serve. The same on Instagram. And hit us up with a review on itunes thank you to a listener from south africa 
who wrote a review by the name of Nole Rena Fan. We suspect it may be you, Fabian. We're not sure. Let us know. I know you're not in South Africa, but there's just too many similarities here. Yeah, and I don't think Lufefe is a Nole fan. So I would be surprised. I would be surprised. So I not that there's any judgment cast on you Nole fans. <laughs> no, all are welcome to the table. We're just saying from what we know of Lufefe, we don't think it's him. So if it is you, Fabian, thank you. If it's somebody else, thank you as well. And we look forward to thanking other people on future episodes. <laughs> Till next time.